you listeners and welcome to the show. I'm Charlie Bosco and joining me this week is a legend of motorsport, Derek Warwick. Before we bring you my chat with Derek, I want to tell you about the sponsor of today's show, Formula One website, thejudge13.com, which provides Formula One daily news, inside whispers and opinion. The Judge 13 is often the first source for breaking F1 stories and paddock rumour from team members who choose to anonymously disclose what's really happening in F1. The Judge 13 has been involved in Formula One for over 30 years and has built relationships with Formula One employees from various teams. The TJ13 website also provides a platform for passionate fans who wish to create their own F1 content and have their voice heard in the media. TJ13 F1 by the fans, for the fans. So, today's guest, Derek Warwick's racing career, has been incredibly diverse. He raced 11 years in Formula 1, but has also competed in, amongst others, stock car racing, Formula 3, touring cars, and the legendary Le Mans 24-hour race, which he won in 1992. However, his life in motorsport has not been all plain sailing, far from it, in fact. He never won a Formula One race and is considered by some to be the best F1 driver never to win a race, but came incredibly close on a couple of occasions, only to be let down by car reliability or a botched pit stop. He also missed out narrowly on a seat in a very fast Williams car in 1985, and then fell foul of Ayrton Senna's ruthless streak in 1986 when he should have signed for Lotus. Derek tells us both those stories in today's interview and also explains why and how his and Senna's relationship recovered before Senna's death in 1994. The greatest loss Derek suffered, however, came when his brother was killed racing in 1991 and Derek explains today how and why he carried on racing after that horrific day. He also talks about his passion for motorsports, how it all began, and what that feeling is like when you actually realise that you're a Formula One driver. There's a lot more to Derek than just racing, though. He's a successful businessman and still works every day in his car dealership on the island of Jersey. He's also heavily involved with the British Racing Drivers Club and is on the safety team of the Motorsports Association. Derek leads a full life and this was an appropriately full and rich interview with insight, honesty and a good dose of humour and it was a pleasure to sit down with him in the garden of his Jersey home. This is a treat. Enjoy. Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me here in Jersey. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for, for coming here. Well, I was in a rainy London this morning in Crawley near Gatwick Airport and we're sitting here in Jersey. I'm worried about sunburn. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's generally a few degrees warmer than the south of England and uh, it's been a great place for me to, uh, uh, to bring up the children and I've been here 32, 33 years. Um, so I absolutely love the place, I really do. And one thing that's always stood out for me when I've heard other interviews with you is your clear passion for your sport, for Formula One. And you really seem to understand how lucky you are to have, to have done what you've done and been involved with the sport. I am passionate about my sport. and That's why I try to give um, as much as I can back to it because it's been very good to me. You know, and, and, and I can count a lot of tragedies along the way, but overall it's been very good to me. Um, I love um, the, helping the young British drivers. You know, so I'm involved with the BIDC. I just recently stepped down as president, um, but uh, we've got three uh, young driver programs, uh, which I'm massively involved with. Uh, absolutely love it. But yeah, my sport, you know, I, I, I love my sport. I love motor racing. I love, that's why I go back as a driver steward, um, just because I can keep up to date with modern technology, um, get to know the, the new young drivers. Um, and also, you know, I, I'd lie if I didn't say that, you know, some of our British drivers are in the support races. So uh, that gives me um, a sort of a, a, a double enjoyment, if you like. Do you tell the current drivers how lucky they are? 
Um, unfortunately, they, don't, they won't really realise it until they finish, you know, because you're so focused on the job. You know, I was when I was in, in Formula One. You, you don't think how lucky you are. You just think that you're doing doing what you love, um, which is which is one thing. You're doing it to the best of your ability. Um, and, of course, it, you know, it, it was different in my era um, just because it definitely was more dangerous, you know, and, and whether you like it or not, that gave the drivers uh, a little bit more respect, possibly than what they have today. Do you ever step back and think about the danger or about how lucky you are to be there? Or when you're in it, are you just completely wrapped up? Did you not realize how fortunate you've been and how much fun you'd had almost until it was done? No, I didn't really, because, um, you know, you, you always you always believed that it would happen to somebody else and not you, um, which for, for me, that's exactly what the case was. You always had 100% um, confidence that, that you would step out at the end of the race. It never even crossed your mind. I, you know, I've had some pretty big serious accidents um, where I've run back for the spare car and started again. Um, you know, that, that, that shows the sort of self-confidence, um, desire, uh, love, um, uh, that, that, that you have for the sport and, and respect. You have to have enormous respect for the sport as well. And where did that passion come from? When did you realize, I guess, not only that you had a passion, but more importantly, you had a, a talent for it? Um, later on in life, actually, because... Um, uh, yeah, but it, it seems interesting. It doesn't seem like you were destined to be an F1 driver from the start. Definitely not. No, I mean, I was a million miles away from, from, from circuit racing, let alone um, uh, Formula One. You know, I was I was lucky to have what I always um, call two fathers. I had my, my, my normal father that was um, quite conservative, um, strong-willed, uh, very competitive, um, but always looked after his family. Then I had his, his elder brother, Uncle Stan, who was a nutter. You know, he, he was always looking for the next adventure. He flew helicopters and planes and crash cars and all that sort of stuff. And I think a bit of each of that ra uh, rubbed off on me. And, um, you know, Warwick Trailers, which, is, which was the, the foundation, if you like, of, of, of my upbringing. You know, as soon as I uh, left school or the times I didn't go to school, I'd be working at Warwick Trailers. That was my passion. And then gradually as I got older, um, I started racing in super stocks, which is like Formula 2 uh, Brisker Speedworth um, cars. And from that age, I was already building my own chassis, building my own engines, racing. I become world champion. Um, and even then, when I become world champion, um, English champion, etc., etc., even then, I, 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 net, I didn't. I'm not even sure I was really aware of Formula One. I knew it was there. Um, it was only later on that I started to to look at people like uh, Jackie Stewart, um, Jochen Rindt, Carlos Pache, um, all what I call the great drivers. And then you start understanding the sport. And it's not until, again, my mad uncle, Uncle Stan, um, that was flying planes out of Thruxton, um, saw Formula Ford in the end of 74, I think it was, and he said, here, we've got to do this. Um, so really, it was, it was from that, and that, the end of that year, we went to a racing car show, and um, we brought a Hawk um, Formula Ford. Yeah, looking, studying your career in the 70s, it seemed like you raced as much as humanly possible. Not just in, uh, when did you make your Formula One debut? Uh, 81. 81, yeah, and in the 70s, it just seemed like you wanted to race anything. Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, um, we, we were used to racing three times a week as, as super stocks. So, you know, we, 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 uh, we would race maybe Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, maybe Saturday or Sunday, whatever. So we were used to doing a lot of races. Um, and there was, one, there was one policy that my father insisted on. We were not allowed to work on the race car, i.e. the stock car, um, during working hours. You know, we'd get into work at 7 o'clock in the morning and we'd finish at 6 o'clock at night and then we'd go home for tea and then we'd come back and work on the Superstock. And, and that, was, that was a rule and we never really, we did break it now and again, of course you do because you have damage or whatever. Um, but that was the golden rule that, that it was a sport and it was a, a byproduct of work. And it was always a battle to survive financially, I guess, when you started racing. Yeah, we, we were wealthy enough to do super stocks properly. You know, um, my Uncle Stan would always go off and buy new bits for the engine, a, a new head, new carburetors, new, new something. Um, so, you know, we were, we were wealthy in super stock terms. 
Uh, but once we got to Formula Ford, it was a big decision, you know. And, and I remember uh, uh, Dad, my father, didn't want anything to do with it. And we lied um, to tell them how much the car would cost and how much the season would cost. And uh, driven by my mad Uncle Stan, I may add. And um, so, you know, because if I'd have come out and said, you know, Formula 4 was going to cost us, I think in the end it cost us eight, or eight nine grand or something, um, he would have said absolutely no. You know, we weren't wealthy enough just to throw 10 grand at it, that's for sure. So talk me through that final stage of the journey. You get to Formula 4, you obviously realise now you're a talented driver. What's the, the leap to Formula 1? Because it seems like a so from the outside it seems like a huge leap yeah i mean i th i think i had some talent because obviously you don't become world champion and you know it's, it's a really tough game um short ovals you know you've got two corners so there's not a lot to gain on anybody so i was quite aggressive very competitive you know even from working in the family business you know i would build a trailer twice as quick as my next door you know i would spray quicker than the next guy i would bend metal quicker than the next guy so i was always super competitive um so then when we got to formula ford we we kind of picked the wrong car in um in 75 um a hawk dl12 uh not a good car at all but easy to to manage and then by mid-season um they'd already uh, he'd already designed a new car called the hawk dl15 uh we we started racing at the end of of uh, 75 and then we took it into 76 and, you know, we won, we, we raced in 63 races, we won 33. Uh, we spread ourselves a little bit too thin. We didn't win all the championships that we wanted to, but we've become uh, European champions. And, you know, we were second in the, the festival. Um, it's a subject I don't like talking too much about because I should have won the festival. But anyway, um, and even then, you know, it was then, it was 76 that James Hunt won the world championship at Suzuka. It was 76 that, you know, Brands Hatch when he had that big ooha with the Ferraris and they wouldn't let him race and then he did race. So then all of a sudden I was glued to the television and I was glued to uh, to Formula One. Then I started understanding what Formula One uh, was. But at the same time, we had um, um, what used to be called Formula 5000 that used to race with us in support races, which is effectively a Formula One car uh, with Teddy Pellett and Alan Jones and people like that. And I was starstruck right from the beginning. You know, when you saw these massive V8s come through Snedderton or, um, or Alton Park or uh, places like that, you used to think these guys have got bigger hoolies, I tell you. I mean, I was just, I was, I was starstruck <laughs> by them. They really was. Um, and then we had to do another little lie. Um, in, in 77, um, we wanted to step, step up to Formula 3. We couldn't afford it. Uh, we had a little bit of money from BP, but not much. Um, and um, we almost stopped racing, to be fair. We were very busy at work, unbelievably busy. And I remember our sales manager come to us and said, look, we've got a, um, a quote for six trailers for Saudi Arabia. And um, Dad said, absolutely no way can we fit these six trailers in. Um, uh, we, we just can't do it. And he said, well, I have to quote. We have to quote, otherwise we'll lose credibility. So we put a silly number on these trailers. And the order came through. So we decided between the three of us, Dad, Stan, and myself, that we'd build them in the evenings. And we built these six trailers, knocked them out really quickly, sent them away. And on the back of that, we went Formula 3 racing in 77. Okay, there's so many things to follow up on on that. But the one thing you said that uh, is fascinating is your natural competitiveness. Have you any idea where that came from? Um, was it just a desire to win at everything? Yes. Yeah. It wasn't specific to sport. No, it wasn't. And it was, like I say, you know, I think it's my father, really. My father was more competitive than my Uncle Stan. My Uncle Stan was a bit more laid back, although, as I described, is, is a bit of a nutter. Um, but I think I was just competitive. My girls, I've got two daughters. I mean, they're just ridiculously competitive. I've got three grandsons. Do you encourage that? Oh, absolutely. You know, they're ridiculously competitive, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's part of life. It's part of um, growing up. It's, you want them to be achievers, not non-achievers. And being competitive is, is, is a part of that profile. The other thing that struck me then was we started out talking about your passion for Formula One. You, your eyes lit up when you were explaining about the V8s at Snetterton and everything. Can you put your finger on what it is about Formula One that draws you in? Because a lot of people listening to this, this is a general sports podcast. We've talked to people from all different walks of life and sport. 
to someone listening to this who might be vaguely aware of Formula One, why, why should they sit down and watch it? What is it about it that keeps you so interested? Um, I think, first of all, you have to love sport. You know, and, and I think if you watch any sport that's got the great greats in, tennis with McEnroe and Federer and um, Djokovic and, and people like that, the Williams sisters, golf with Tiger Woods. Um, I just love all sport that's, that's super competitive. With Formula One, it's motorsport. It's, 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 it's where the sport, a motorsport all around the world is driven from, I think. You know, it cascades down from Formula One. Formula One is the profile that helps all the junior drivers find the money because they're all as aspiring Grand Prix drivers. It's where the razzmatazz is, it's where the money is, it's where the speed is. Everything I've driven in my life, and I'm talking about sports cars, I won Le Mans, I won, I won the World Championship in sports cars, I've driven stock cars, I've driven Formula 3, uh, Formula 2, every, Formula 1's another level. You in know, terms of difficulty and speed? Difficulty, speed, um, getting the right drive, being in the right situation, the whole thing is, there's only, you, know, you take this year, there's only 20 drivers in the world that can compete in Formula 1. There's not many sports you can say that, you know, if, it, if, you, if it's tennis or it's golf, there's hundreds if not thousands that can compete to be number one in the world. You can't in Formula One. And there's also so much to learn with Formula One as well. I mean, you've, you've not just got outright pace, but you've got racecraft and you're also dealing with this huge circus that is Formula One. Yeah, and did, is it... did you find that uh, appealing or, and did you find it easy to deal with? I just have to say I'm lucky because I love every aspect of being a racing driver. I love the training, I love the grit, uh, running in the rain, um, pounding the, uh, the gym. Um, I, loved the, I used to love the testing of it. I used to go round and round and round and round. I just enjoy driving race cars. Um, and I think that that, that, that really is, is set me up well to be a Grand Prix driver. That's why I lasted, even though I said to you earlier on, I, I've never won a Grand Prix. Um, but I have to say, um, I love every aspect. I love the PR. Um, I love the fame. I love signing the autographs. I love speaking to every part of motorsport, whether it's a, uh, a journalist or whether it's a, um, a, a marshal, um, a sponsor, uh, fellow drivers, team members, my mechanics. I, you know, I used to go and eat with them every night because I, they, were, they were the people that, that kept me alive. You know? So you know, you, you, I, just, I was just lucky. You, know, you hear a lot of drivers, Eddie Irvine and uh, people like that, great drivers that have won, won Grand Prix. Um, you used to have to time in a corner and, and get them into the gym because they just hated that part of it. You've got Kimi Raikkonen who hates the, uh, the PR and, the, uh, uh, and the, um, the things that go with that. He just absolutely hates it. Whereas I loved every part of it. Absolutely every part of it. Well, first thing, you've just broken my heart because I know I'll never be a Formula One driver and I've just heard you speaking about it with that passion. But in 81, did it ever actually hit you Okay, I am a Formula One driver. Um, I think, if I just go back a little bit, I think it was 78 when um, I won one of the championships and Nelson Piquet won the other championship. I then started to realize that, that maybe I was good enough, you know, because I didn't really, because it was just still too far away because of, of budget, of, of, of cost. So in 78, I started to realize that I wasn't too bad at this. You know, I won 13 races in, or in, um, in 78. Um, 79, I almost died because, uh, not died as in literally, just um, the car was bad, we never had no money, and we almost stopped racing again. Then BP saved us in 1980 with Formula 2, and BP and Tolman took me into, into Formula 1. And still one of the best memories of my life is standing at Imola, my very first Grand Prix, knowing full well I wouldn't qualify, the car just wasn't quick enough. Um, but that was the proudest moment of my life, that I'd come from welding agricultural trailers uh, to racing short ovals with, with super stocks um, to being a Grand Prix driver um, with almost no backing, but a, f a little bit in the early days. And then when you got to Formula One, What's it like? Were you overawed or were you instantly inspired and you just thought, this is me, I belong here? Or does part of you think, almost feel like a pretender? Like you're racing the guys you were watching on TV the year before? Um, it's kind of bizarre, really. Um, you, you, you knew you were there because you were good enough. You also knew that the car you were driving 
was not going to qualify the first part of the season. You knew that... This was back in the day when you didn't automatically qualify for the race. Correct. You know, there was 30 cars and pre-qualifying and only 26 started. And, you know, there was always four or five that didn't quite make it. So, um, yeah, we were, were a part of that gang. Uh, whereas today, we were qualified. Um, because there's only 20 cars and 20 cars are qualified. You'd have been last, but you would have qualified. Um, I think that uh, um, you, you're, you're, you're a bit in all of... The kind of talent that was around, Gilles Villeneuve, um, Patrick Tombe, uh, Nicky Lauda, um, Nelson Piquet, um, all the great champions that were around, Emerson Fittipaldi, you know, you just, you can name 20 drivers that, that could have won Grand Prix, as you can today, in, in the right car, of course, um, but these were, these were household names, these were, these were people that I was reading about, watching on TV, that, that, that were changing our sport, and, um, and all of a sudden, I'm a part of that, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say in all of, all of them, more a case of, I felt I was right there, I felt, I felt that it was the right place for me, um, and I knew I just had to work as hard as I could. Um, if I got a break, lucky break, use it to the maximum. You know, and I think that's what a lot of people don't do. They just, as I see young drivers sometimes over the last 20, 30, 40 years, massive talent, super, super quick. But they kind of relax when they get there. They don't push on. Um, you know, Verstappen being a good example of someone that does push on. You know, he's so hungry, he's so competitive. And we've had a few of those in the past, of course, but we've had a few that are just lazy. They, they, they just don't apply themselves. But is it hard when you come up through the formulas you're used to winning almost week in, week out, and suddenly you just... I don't want to sound rude, but you make up the numbers. You know you're not going to win because of the car you're in. Is, is that hard for your motivation? No, because you're in Formula 1. You're in Formula 1, you've got to wait your chance. You've just got to work hard all the time. But you're clearly... Uh, well, clearly not everyone is like you in that. You've mentioned some drivers, and I'm a big Formula 1 fan, but there are some drivers that have been at the back of the grid, and I couldn't pick them up out of a line-out because they're not thrusting themselves forward they're not putting in spectacular drives and not being interviewed by the press they are just a name on the screen at times so you're clearly not if not unusual not everyone's like you um i think um one mistake i made um in formula one in my career well two mistakes really one was not having a manager i try to do everything myself um and you can't sell yourself like a manager can sell you um and the second thing is um i think i was I was too nice, not in the car, because if, if you speak to any of my teammates um, or teams, they will know I was a nasty piece of work, you know, and you didn't cross me, you didn't foul me, um, because I'd tear you in half. But I was very nice out of the car. When I think now, it's not, it's not that nice people can't win, because I, I don't agree with that a million percent, absolutely not. It's more a case of the people that really make it, stand out they're controversial you know they're they're difficult they're quirky and i was never i was sort of uh, a little bit um uh, yeah what's the right word middle of the road you know i was a little bit vanilla you know and and i think i think looking back now uh, lewis hamilton a good example marmite you like it you don't like him is he good for formula one Bloody right he is. Front page, middle page, back page. You know, he's, he's, he's headlines. He promotes our sport um, massively. And, and, I w and I wish now that I was a little bit more controversial in the early days. Do you feel that he naturally could have been? You wouldn't have had... I mean, were you suppressing your natural personality? No, that was me. I was only ever me. And I think, you know, when I look back now, I was, I was me. You know, everybody liked me and I was, I was good fun to be around, I think. Um, but that was me. I didn't, there was no act. I never, I never told people I was a Grand Prix driver. You know, I was a Grand Prix driver. You know, it's, it's, it, I see people that, that have to tell you what they are, who they are, are people that, that have been caught in the headlights. And I, I've never been caught in the headlights. And I didn't come here to ask you about Lewis Hamilton, but I'm interested in your uh, take on him now. You brought him up because watching from the outside, it sometimes seems to me he's got this, uh, I don't know how to describe his lifestyle, full. He's a busy man. He travels a lot and he's involved with fashion and all sorts. And the perception you hear a lot of 
the time, particularly from older races, is that that can't be the best way to maximise his talent. It sounds like you disagree. I disagree because I think we're all different. Um, I think we're all motivated in different ways. I was motivated by uh, the person I was, by my family, by my friends. I wanted friends around me. I wanted to eat with my mechanics. That, that inspired me. That, 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 that um, got me going. Lewis Hamilton's different, you know. I'll be honest with you. I was one of his critics early on when he was you know, in New York one day and Aspen the next and then Madrid the next and flying around his private plane, having parties and uh, fashion shows and uh, girls um, hung off his arms. I actually thought that was wrong. Only wrong because I didn't know how he could commit his life to, to training, um, to, to having his, 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 the, the mental strength that you need um, to, uh, to be a racing driver on the Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Well, it's hard to imagine that being conducive with being the best driver you can be. Um, but then we have to ask ourselves, if we put him back into another box um, and made him um, be like the rest of us, would he be able to raise his game to, to what we saw in Barcelona just two weeks ago? He was outrageously brilliant in Barcelona. It was so effortless the way he drove that car. Now, that's great drivers. That's not good drivers. That's great drivers. So whatever he's doing is working. Which category did you fall into? Were you someone that needed to dedicate their life to it or were you more of the Lewis type where the best thing you could do was almost, not, it seems like he doesn't think about it almost until he gets in the car and it's just, it's instinct. For me, it was about preparation. Um, you felt better if you really just yeah. had covered every base. Yeah, if I was fit and ready to go, I could, I could be faster than anybody out there. You know, I, I used to look at people like Nicky Lauda, who had his own nutritionist, his own trainer, and all that sort of stuff. And right from the year one, when I was only earning uh, 30, 40,000 pounds a year, I was paying my own flights, um, and I was also had my own trainer. I made sure that I was the best prepared driver out there or the best prepared I could be out there because I knew then that um, that I would do the best job I can. That was the way I was. What did that entail then? Were you able to maintain personal relationships or is your focus just laser-like? I've always summed myself up this way. I am the most selfish, unselfish person you will ever meet. Selfish because when I was training, which I trained every single day of my life, when I was doing things for Formula One, which I was doing most days of my life, when I was testing, when I was racing, you could not distract me one bit. Whether my family was there, whether my friends were there, whatever. When that weekend was over and I had a weekend off, I gave myself one million percent to my family, to my children, to my wife, to my friends, to everybody. And that's why I say I'm selfish and unselfish, because I could switch off of being a racing driver. I would still get up and run and cycle and gym and everything else, but then I'd be yours, you know. It seems as well, in, you've lived a very full life, not only in terms of Formula One, but you've had a business and a family and you're part of the BRDC and there's all sorts going on in your life. Is that your, your modus operandi? Just whatever you're doing, you're just giving that a million percent and then you think about the next thing. Yeah, to my own detriment sometimes. You know, I, 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 I've, never, I've never been able to use the word no. <laughs> um, so, um, so people come to me and it's always a yes, a bit, a bit, a bit like you sat here now. You know, I should be sat sunbathing now, but I'm talking to you. But. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I've been joking. Um, the last 10 years have been different because, you know, I, I want to put some back into my sport. Um, that's why I joined the BIDC. I've been there for 10 years. I've been president for seven years. Um, I'm on the safe... When, when my little brother was killed, um, I then realized um, that we live in... Formula One, when you're in Formula One, it is the biggest thing in the world. Everybody in the whole wide world is looking at you. It's not until you step outside of Formula One when you stop that you realize it's just a pinhead. It's a little blot on the landscape. Um, because when, when my little brother was killed, um, I stepped outside of that um, circle for a little while because uh, I couldn't understand how he could be killed at a, um, a circuit. And it wasn't until I started to get involved with the safety committee of the MSA that I realized just how dangerous some of our British circuits were. So I, I, I then joined the safety committee of the MSA, which I've been there now for 25 years, 26 years. Um, and, you know, we, we walked every single circuit in the British Isles. Um, trying to make it better, trying to um, improve runoffs and gravel traps and safety fences and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, there's, somebody uh, said to me, you know, 
what good can come from your little brother being killed well, hopefully it saved a lot of other lives because I put my life and soul into um, helping British circuits become safer. How did it affect your psychology in the car? Did you think about just walking away from it all? Um, it was difficult. Uh, Paul was um, something very, very special to me um, and our family. He was the little brother. He was a baby brother. Um, he started racing, um, as you well know. Uh, in the early career, he, he wasn't particularly quick, but he was okay. As he went up the ladder and got to more powerful cars, um, especially the last year he was in Formula 5, uh, 3000, um, he was super quick. He was unbeatable. Um, he was super fit. Um, he became a man. Um, he was beating me in everything we were trying to do, whether it was running, cycling, gym, uh, cross-country skiing, whatever we did. Um, and um, and I think that uh, when when he... Uh, was killed at Alton Park, uh, it made me think about why I was still doing it. You know, I was getting on a little, little bit later in my life as well. Um, I was actually racing for Jaguar at the time. I was out of Formula One. And I promised my mum, well, I said to my mother that I would stop racing there and then. And then after about 10 days, I was put a lot of pressure from Tom Walkinshaw and Jaguar to, to come back. And um, I went to my mother, who... My mother was a typical old-fashioned person that, you know, cleaned my shoes and put toothpaste on my toothbrush and just did everything for their, for their families. Um, but he, she never really had an opinion on anything. And, but anyway, I called a big meeting with all the family, my sisters and brothers-in-law and dad and Stan and mum and everybody, because and, I changed my mind. I, I, I said I wanted to try. Um, and there was outrage in the family, my sister's rebelled and said, you know, we've lost one brother, we don't want to lose another one. And it was really um, quite a difficult time. So um, anyway, um, in the middle of this meeting, my mum steps up and says, hang on, you know, uh, Derek's been a racing driver all his life. He's a great racing driver. Um, he should have to make this decision. And I remember as if it was just yesterday, everybody turning to my mother going, what? You have an opinion on something? <laughs> And anyway, so we, um, I, the, the, everybody agreed in the end, and uh, I went off, and um, Tom did a secret test at the A1 ring um, with Jaguar. And I went there the first day. I drove the whole day, um, had a damper break right at the end, threw me into the rent curve um, at 220 mile an hour, got out of the car, went back to the hotel, and just cried my eyes out. I just cried and cried and cried. And I remember at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, in the bathroom, looking in the mirror, and saying to myself, right, you've got to make a decision here. You've got to find a way. You either got to pack your bags, go, to the, go back to the airport and go home, or you've got to find a way of, of doing this. And I created this. I, I already had it, I think, but I cr this safe in the back of my mind. I always had this safe and where I'd put tragedy. Um, and and I, that morning, I put Paul in the safe. I went to the track, broke the lap record, and the fastest I've ever been, um, and I was back to my normal place. When the test was over, I remember going to the airport, unlocking the safe, putting Paul back out, and just cried all the way to the airport. And that's how I went through the rest of my career then. I would, I'd put him in on a Thursday morning, and I'd take him out on a Sunday night, Monday morning, whatever. Um, and that's how I, I, I put him so far in the back of my head that sometimes I carried a picture to remind myself when I unlocked him what he looked like. And, and I think that's, for a Formula One driver today would n have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but back in them days, I think all the successful drivers that had long careers um, all had this little safe that they were able to put tragedy behind them. I I've never been frightened in a race car. I've had some big accidents and like I say, run back for the spare car. But I have to say that um, uh, I've got this inbuilt um, security that says to me it would never happen to you um, and I believe that 100% and looking back over the course of your Formula 1 career in, in general now you had times it seemed uh, 84, 85 you had a pretty decent car it's a bit of a, it's a huge question but when you look back at your career now and opportunities missed and opportunities taken can you, can you sum it up can you reflect on it as a whole Easy, I've got no regrets. 
I can look back now, um, and obviously I should have signed for Williams for '85. But yeah, I was you know, I mean, I was hinting at that. Yeah, yeah, and obviously, um, I it would have been good if I'd have been um, Ayrton's teammate in, in '86 before he he, he uh, uh, threw me out of the team effectively. But you know what? I look back at those decisions, that the wrong decisions that I made. And I can say with my hand on my heart, they were the right decisions at the time. Sure, with hindsight, they were the wrong decisions. But do I, does it keep me up at night? No. Do I worry about it? No. Am I proud of my career? Absolutely I am. I, I don't want for any more. You know, I'm, I'm a, a moderately wealthy person. Um, I can do most things I want to do. Um, and um, I'm happy in life. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about those two years as, that you mentioned, 85. You turned down Williams, and then you had your run-in with the legendary Ayrton Senna. I know the story, but there'll be a lot of people listening that don't know the story. Can you explain what happened with Williams in 85 and then also with Ayrton Senna in 86? Well, 84 was a great year. I went from earning peanuts to millions, um, and that's why I'm in sunny Jersey. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so my life changed massively in 84. And uh, about mid-year, I had only had a one-year contract. LaRousse, who was the boss of uh, Renault, came to me at the British Grand Prix um, in, in 84 and handed me a contract for 85. And I said, look, I'm sorry, um, I'm talking to other people. And I had a little chat with Ferrari um, and a big chat with, with, with Williams. Um, but in the end, I thought being with a works team was the right thing to do. Sure. Who were Williams taking their engine from then? Uh, Honda. Honda. And of course, 84 wasn't a brilliant year for Honda with Keke Rosberg. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of reasons to stay with Renault. 85, uh, we lost all our top guys. Michel Tetu, um, our chief engineer, uh, went. Um, LaRousse went. Uh, Michel, our aerodynamics went. So we lost, we lost about seven or eight key guys uh, from the top of our, um, uh, our engineering department. The 85 car was just shite. It was just dreadful. I remember taking it to um, Brazil at the beginning of 85. It was three and a half seconds slower than the 84 car. Um, but you know, it was what it was. The year was a disaster, um, and I was, uh, everybody knows uh, the team stopped at the end of '85. So by the mid end of '85, I was talking to other teams. Um, I'd had a contract with Lotus. Um, I'd signed my contract, sent it back to them, um, and I was going to be um, Ed and Senna's teammate for the '86 season. So I put all my eggs in that basket. There was other things around, but I wanted to drive the Lotus, and I want, it looked like I had the potential. And it looked like I'd be in a good position, uh, situation uh, with Ayrton, who was becoming a legend. Um, and then Ayrton for sure didn't want me to drive the car. He put massive pressure on the sponsor um, because he was, uh, he, he was the blue-eyed boy, if you like. The sponsor put massive pressure on Lotus. Um, I was called to, to Lotus um, in December um, uh, '85. Um, and they tore the contract up in front of me and said that I'm really sorry, but Ayrton's demanding that um, we can't supply because I had equal number one, so equal call opposite, sorry, alternative use of the spare car, equal number ones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it was a backhanded compliment from Ayrton, really. I think he knew I would give him trouble. Um, he also knew that the team probably could only produce one number one car. He wanted the spare car for himself all the time. There's your selfishness again. Um, and he wanted a number two in the car. And um, so he, he worked, he worked his, his, uh, his method, if you like, um, and he worked all the sponsors, and they threw me out the team. But I have to say that um, I don't think he bared any malice with that because he sent me a... Um, uh, a New Year's card, the end of 85, wishing me all the best for 86. Knowing you hadn't got a drive No, I don't, think, I don't think he even thought about it. I don't think it crossed his mind. Did I don't he know the, the... He must have been aware they'd pre-signed you and then... No, he knew, he knew obviously that, that he had got me out the team, but he didn't know that I didn't have anything else to drive because at that time all the Formula 1 drives were filled. So I ended up without a drive. So... Um, do not mention the name Ayrton Senna inside the house because Rondo will probably throw you out. But I kind of admire it in some ways because he was under enormous pressure from the British press. They hated him. They, they, they really took him through the grinder. For this um, incident? For this incident because they were, they were, they, he was killing the career of their favorite British driver. So, you know, it was, uh, but he withstood it, didn't really care um, and pushed on as we all know.
Well, yeah, you were saying earlier you had laser-like focus, you could be very selfish. You, I think you described yourself as a nasty such piece of work. Such, yeah, nasty <laughs> piece of work at times. I get the impression you don't really resent him for what he did. Look, you know, things happen, you know, you, you can't turn back the clock, you know, there's no point wishing, you know, how many people would wish that they were out in centre? They'd be dead now. So, you know, just just be happy with what you've got. You just drive forward what you've got. Make the most of what you've got. And then and then you can be happy. If I can if I can lay in my coffin and think I've done the best job I can, then I'm going to die happy. Do you think you'd have beaten him? I think I'd have given him... I, th I think there have been races where I'd have been quicker than him. There have been races where he'd have been quicker than me. Would it have been 50-50? I don't really know because we, we now have all been caught up in the legend of Ayrton Senna. He was something special. Did I, do I think I was something special? I don't know. I don't really think I was able to prove it in the right car. Was I normally quicker than my teammates in Formula One and sports cars? Yes, I was. Um, so, you know, all I can say is I was always quicker than my teammate. Not always, but a majority of the time. It just goes to show, doesn't it, what a fine line it is between success and failure. It's not necessarily even in the car. It's the decisions made outside it and the politics outside it. Absolutely, but that's the same for everything, I'm afraid. You know, I, I, like I say, I, don't, I didn't bear him any malice. He invited me to the funeral, the family did rather. You know, I carried the coffin to his grave. So the family surely um, understood what, what happened. And probably with hindsight, he and the family spoke about how it ruined or, or um, stopped my career, if you like. So I'm sure, and, and I remember speaking to his mum who said that, um, you know, Ayrton was always very fond of me. You know, which makes me think that maybe he did think of that moment in uh, 85, 86. But your career got back on track, didn't it? And, and presumably your relationship with Ayrton was salvaged to an extent? No, our, our relationship was very good. You know, we always had um, complete, um, um, uh, not commitment, what's the right word? respect for each other. Mutual respect. Very much so. Um, and on the track when, you know, if he stopped me, if he bolted me on a qualifying lap, he knew I would get him back, you know, and, and, and he would put his hand up and wave and apologize. And, and so there was a lot of mutual respect. But uh, I think that um, it was difficult. I was out of Formula One and then the tragedy um, with um, Elio De Angelis, uh, Paul Ricard driving the Brabham in testing, um, he was killed there. Um, I didn't call Bernie. Uh, apparently, Bernie had something like 10 Formula, out, out of work Formula One drivers ringing within the hour, um, and I didn't. And I think Bernie respected that, and he called me about a week, 10 days later, sent a plane over, and, um, and I signed the contract. And what was the remainder of your uh, Formula One career like? I mean, it stalled. Uh, to be honest, it stalled. '86 was 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 a good year. I was I was I out qualified Patrese a few times, but he more so than me. He knew the car, he knew the team. He had BMW behind him, um, and I found myself um, in with Arrows in '87, '88, and '89. Gr great great um, time at Arrows. I really respected the guys. The '89 car, the the, the Ross Braun designed uh, little V8. Uh, it was a beautiful car, a car capable of winning, but we just didn't have the money and it was unreliable. Um, and we, w we, we could have won races that year if we'd have had a bigger budget. And what's it like when you stop Formula One and you walk away? I mean, it's, it, you'd been so wrapped up in it, as you said. And I know you've got a family and other things in your life, but is it hard when you walk away or was the time right for you? Well, I then did two years of sports cars with Jaguar and um, in, uh, where am I? Well, no, I signed for Lotus in 90. Um, then I was Jaguar uh, 91, Peugeot 92, won Le Mans with Jean Tot um, and become world champion. And then came back to Formula One in 93. Um, but in 93, I realized that I was 38, 39. Um, I passed that peak. I was doing all sorts of things to be as quick, if not quicker, than my teammate, Martin Donnelly. Uh, sorry, not Monday, uh, Aguri Suzuki, um, and it was the right time to stop. So was it a hardship at the end of 93? No, it was the right time, 100%. Did you miss it, or do you miss it now? I don't miss it now because I'm involved in it. Uh, maybe that's why I've decided to put so much back into the sport because I'm still involved with it. Maybe I did, maybe subconsciously it was my way of staying involved. Um, I... Uh, 
I missed Formula One for a while. Um, that's why we started our own touring car team with Triple Eight, because uh, we we needed that buzz of being a part of something. Um, and um, but it was the right time for me to stop Formula One, and I've got no regrets whatsoever. And you've just got back from London. I flew in as well. Where, as I mentioned at the start, where there's a lot nicer here than uh, in London. Um, and it seems like even now you're you're driven, you're busy, you're doing things. Can you put your finger on why, what makes you so driven, why you don't just sit here in this beautiful Jersey sun? Um, you know, I, I'm, I've never been busier than what I am at the moment. I employ over 100 people. I've got um, development companies in the UK. I've got a garage here, a race team in Australia. Um, it, I'm involved with three young driver programs. I'm still a, 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 an MSA safety steward. I'm an FIA um, steward. Um, I have to be busy. You know, I don't know any other way. Um, I think it's my upbringing. You know, I still get into work now at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, which I did, my father insisted on, um, all those years back. And I still do it today. I open the doors at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't now work to 6 o'clock. <laughs> I, go, I go home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and sit outside here and enjoy a few of the trappings that life's given me. Um, so I think I've got a, a, I think I've got a good... Um, a, a good a good way with my the way I I drive my life the way I act my life um, and the respect I've got from uh, people around me well you said about 10 minutes ago that um, when it's all over you hope you'll be able to say you were the best you can be I think your wish will be granted well I don't know about that I, I, I don't know who's going to judge that but all I can say is that you know I've, I've not been a saint in my life, that's for sure, um, but I will admit it as well. Um, generally, I'm a good person. Um, I'm very much a people person. Um, I'm very honest. Um, I don't suffer fools easily, I'll be honest with you. Um, I prefer to be in the company uh, of the local refuge collector than the, the Lord Mayor. Um, it's just the way I, I think I've been brought up. Um, and I speak uh, and I respect both of them equally. Um, and I expect people to treat me the way I treat them. Um, I treat people with respect, 100%, and I expect the same back from them. If I don't, then I can cut them away. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure, and thank you for the interview. I really enjoyed it. And I will let you get back to the sunbathing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you to Derek for his time. I understand even more so now just how busy he is. So I'm doubly grateful for him taking an hour out of his day to chat. If you want to keep up with Derek, check him out on Twitter at Derek Warwick or go to DerekWarwick.com. That's all from The Winning Mentality this week. If you're enjoying these shows, all we ask is that you subscribe and leave us an iTunes review to say thanks. And we'll speak to you next Sunday. <laughs>